Good afternoon, everybody. Well, today we are, going, we are very happy to have among us Glenn Weil. Glenn Weil is a political economist and social technologist seeking to harness computers and markets to create a radically equal and cooperative, co cooperative society. He's the founder, and not anymore the chairman, but the, the founder, of the Radko X Change Foundation, a principal researcher at Microsoft, and teaches at Princeton University, where he made his master's and PhD in economics in 2008. During his career, he has had several positions, such as fellow at Toulouse School of Economics in 2008-2013, an associate member at the University of Chicago Law School, 2013-2016, and visiting senior research scholar and lecturer at the Department of Economics and Law at school at Yale University in 2016-2018. And he wrote the book, as you all know, and we are going to have an auto, auto, autograph session after this seminar in, the, in our uh, bookstore, to which you are all invited. He wrote the book, Radical Markets, Uprooting Capitalism and Democracy for a Just Society, and has many research activities and publications. So we are going to have one hour of speech, and then we are going to open the floor for questions. So Glenn, please, you have the floor. Um, great. So, um, thanks so much for having me here. It's really great to be back. Um, I spent uh, a summer in Rio uh, in 2007, and I spent a lot of time during that summer at FGV. Uh, it's great to see all the new beautiful things that you guys have built in the meantime. Um, it played a major role in inspiring the book, but the truth is that the book turned out unexpectedly to just have been the beginning of a journey. The book was written by uh, me when I would say I was an academic economist. Uh, and now, as, um, as you heard, I'm uh, something a little bit different than that. Uh, and the way I got there is by going around the world, talking to people about the ideas in the book. And in the process of talking to people, I learned a lot. My eyes opened about the broader social and economic issues that it raised. Um, and that changed my whole perspective on economics. Um, I don't know how many people here have seen the movie The Matrix. But in The Matrix, uh, they offer um, two pills to the main character, Neo, red and blue. Uh, and in blue, you get to stay with the world that you know. And the red, you get to see things as they really are. And I feel like the last few months, I took a red pill. And uh, I maybe will take you with me on that journey a little bit in this talk. So if you prefer not to see that, uh, I recommend you leave now. So um, the, the crucial idea, as I've come to see it, I think in really understanding sort of what's wrong with how we often think about economics is the idea of increasing returns. So um, for those who are studying or uh, trained in academic economics, the idea of increasing returns is quite familiar. It's the notion that if you apply a production function to a, a collection of inputs, a collection of people, let's say, um, you get more out than the sum of what you would get if you applied it to each of the individuals uh, separately. Or supermodularity is another word that mathematicians use for it. But, um, this idea has a very long history in political theory um, well before economics. So Aristotle described it as saying that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And uh, you know, even visually during the American Revolution, they depicted this idea you know, of a, that, that the, without joining together, the different American states would uh, you know, die uh, like the snake. Um, and you know, in my view, this notion that we can all achieve more together than we can separately, uh, increasing returns, is the fundamental thing that defines civilization. 
Um, if we didn't have increasing returns, we would be living like this. And because we have increasing returns, because it is the central defining feature of civilization, we live like this instead, right? Now, um, the problem is that basic fundamental economic theory tells us that all the things that we learn in economics are so great about capitalism don't work with increasing returns. So what do I mean by that? Well, the basic idea of capitalism is that everybody gets paid their marginal product, the amount that they add to some system. But with increasing returns, that's impossible because the sum of everybody's marginal product is greater than the total amount that's created. So um, let me give you an example of this. I recently read an article in the newspaper that said, don't we have such a great deal from Google? Because Google, like most of us would be willing to pay $20,000 a year to have the services that Google gives us. But um, we, they only make uh, $100 off of us every year. And then you say, oh, okay. And how much would we be willing to pay to keep sanitation? Probably $50,000 a year. And how much would we be willing to pay to um, have light bulbs? Uh, $80,000 a year. Okay, pretty soon you're at hundreds, thousands of times the total income that we have. So clearly it doesn't make any sense to say, oh, take the marginal contribution that each of these services makes and let's pay that money to them, right? Because the very nature of civilization is that it's this process of adding things on top of each other, each of which adds a huge amount of value, but you can't just divide up the value according to that to each component part. Now, this is formalized in economics as some very famous results, such as the notion that if you have public goods and you try to provide for them privately, you run into what's called the free rider problem, where every citizen only wants to contribute to the public good up to the value that it gives to them. But instead, the amount that should be given is the total value it gives to everyone. And so if you have a million people that benefit from a public good, private capitalist markets should only provide about one part in a million of the funding that we want to see for this. So that's not like, you know, people sometimes complain, oh, there's 70% tax, you'll discourage investment. This is a 99.999999% tax on investment in public goods. That's what capitalism would give us. Now, sometimes it's not quite so bad. Sometimes you can exclude people. Sometimes you can have a monopoly. But that really doesn't solve the problem very well either because the marginal cost of providing the thing is extremely low, maybe zero. And then you, in order to stay alive, in order to keep up with capitalism, you have to exclude people, charge some price, charge the average cost. But this is completely wasteful. It's usually wasteful to exclude people from the good. It's wasteful to uh, not have them enjoy it. Uh, the whole process is totally inefficient. And that's what capitalism inevitably leads to when applied to increasing returns um, situations. Now, this is not just a problem in theory. I contend, in fact, that most of the problems that we have in the world that we worry about are very predictable if you look at things from this perspective. Um, you know, basically, our world, our civilization, <laughs> is an increasing returns piece of software that we try to run on the decreasing returns hardware called capitalism. And when you try to compile this program, when you try to compile increasing return civilization on decreasing returns capitalism, you constantly get compiler errors. So what's an example of that? Oh, let's take the internet, this networked network effect increasing returns process, and let's run it on the system of private property. What happens? Oh shoot, Mark Zuckerberg ends up as king of the world. Who could have predicted that? 
Who could have predicted that if you treat an increasing returns process as the private property of one person, that you would end up with a dictator over the internet? Oh, let's, let's treat the planet and, and all the economics that go on, a bunch of private property. Oh, shoot, the planet is boiling. Who could have predicted that that would happen? Uh, you treat the radio spectrum. Let's just privatize it. Let's just turn it all into private property. Everything will be fine. Oh, shoot. There are a bunch of over-the-air broadcasters who are just sitting and hogging pieces of property. And any time anyone tries to buy them up, it's impossible because there's so much bargaining. And then you have a few monopolies like Verizon and AT&T, and they provide really bad quality service, and we can't keep up with China. Who would have thought? That that's what's happened when you treat as private property these processes that have national networks. You know, you, you have globalization and all this global interdependence and all the ways we produce together. And you make this the private property of capital. Who would have thought all the benefits flow to capital and in the streets of the countries you have people protesting and upset and they elect Jeremy Corbyn and and Jair Bolsonaro and, uh, and, and uh, Donald Trump. What a surprise. Now, what's the usual solution that we have to this problem? Usually, we say, okay, public good, nation state. Nation state will take care of it. Now, that sounds great, democracy, whatever, but the problem is that democracy represents the will of the majority. And unfortunately, the will of the majority is not always the same as the total well-being of the people, especially when the people who are relevant for a given issue have nothing to do with the people who happen to be in the nation state. So for example, you know, you apply majority rule to the United States. Oh, there are these people called African Americans. Maybe they don't do so well in that process, right? You go to Myanmar and you say, oh, majority rule, let's get, let's get rid of this dictatorship, let's bring in Aung San Suu Kyi, let's bring in democracy, everything will be good. Oh, wait, not so good for everybody in that country, right? Um, so, and, and this problem is particularly bad to the extent that you have diverse societies with persistent minorities, or when you have public goods that don't line up, areas that need public goods that don't line up with the borders of a traditional nation state. Hmm, doesn't that seem like something that's pretty common in the modern world, increasingly common in the modern world? One of my favorite examples of this is the Amazon River. So the Amazon River cuts across, what, six, countries in Latin America, and tiny minorities of people in those countries live near that river. So what that ends up meaning is that the national government, the national polities, want to take advantage of those people who live near there and not take care of the river. And each country does that. And then they all fight with each other. It has nothing to do with the group of people who's actually affected by the Amazon River and is the natural people who should vote on it. It cuts across countries and it's a minority within the country. Think about the drug war in the United States. The drug war in the United States is allegedly for the benefit of black and brown people in the United States who allegedly use drugs the most and it is waged, in fact, against black and brown people in the United States and especially in Central America. And yet, those people are a tiny part of those who vote on the actual policies. The policies are mostly voted on by the white majority in the United States. So, is it a surprise that what you get is policies that systematically criminalize being black in the United States, and that lead to almost a genocide in Central America against the people who get killed in the drug war. Is that any surprise that that's what you get from applying the nation state majority rule to an issue that just is not about that? 
And those things are increasingly the case. Our public goods are provided on the internet, across all sorts of countries, open source software. The people who are the relevant deciders on these issues are just not lined up with the borders of a nation state. Okay, so today I want to try to offer a fundamentally different vision. A vision of a different world governed based on different principles. Um, and I don't usually like words on my slides, but I tried to put this all into one long sentence, just so you have a statement of it once. So I'm going to try to offer a world of near optimal emergent public goods funded by efficiency enhancing taxes based on moving us beyond the idea of private property, governed by nearly optimal systems of voting that thereby create a world um, that no longer is divided between corporations, eco economics, and individuals on the one hand, and nations, politics, and collectives on the other hand. And while this sounds crazy, ambitious, who knows, it's already starting to emerge from experiments that are being coordinated by a growing global social movement. Okay. So let me start with what these organizations are. Um, and this idea called the liberal radical mechanism, or for, to make the economics journals happy, the quadratic finance mechanism, um, was invented, uh, or something I came up with, jointly with this guy Vitalik Buterin. Raise your hand if you know who Vitalik Buterin is. So mo often it's the young people who know, but he's the founder of Ethereum, the largest blockchain platform in the world. Um, and uh, also jointly with Zoe Hitzig, who was a poet, uh, became a philosophy graduate student, and now is doing a PhD in economics at Harvard. So uh, I try to work with I interesting people. Um, and uh, the idea of this system is at once very radical and also very familiar. So many people here will be familiar with the notion of matching funds. Um, that you give to private contributions to, to public goods of various sorts. So, for example, in New York City, if you contribute up to $100 to a political candidate, as long as there are 999 other people contributing to that candidate, you get a match uh, of $6 for every $1 you contribute. Now, um, you might ask, that sounds like an interesting idea, right? Because if you're just one small individual contributing to a candidate, you, you're going to be a free rider. You don't want to contribute. Um, so maybe the public should match to give you more incentive to contribute, to scale up your contribution, right? But you might ask, why six for one? Why $100? Why 999 other people? These are arbitrary numbers, right? So you might ask, is there a way to actually derive from economic theory what will lead to an optimal provision of public goods. And it turns out that there is, and it's actually a relatively simple formula, though it does involve some mathematics, rather than the amount that received by the organization being like under capitalism, the sum of the amounts contributed. Instead, it's the square of the sum of the square roots of the amount contributed. Okay, so uh, I'm sure not everyone is super mathematically inclined in this audience, but I'll just, for the nerds in the audience, give you a little sense of why this is true. So, um, how many people here have heard of the idea from Immanuel Kant of the categorical imperative? Few people, maybe many of the students. So, um, this is sort of a philosophical version of the idea of the golden rule. It says, that whenever you take a decision, you should act as if, by your making that decision, everyone else in the world will act according to the same principle. So be honest because you want a world where everyone's honest, for example. So um, you can see why that would address the problem of public goods. People wouldn't free ride because they don't want other people to free ride, right? So um, if we're a homogeneous group. If all of us are the same, and there's maybe 100 of us contributing to a public good, it's pretty easy to see how that solves the problem. We would all be willing to tax ourselves for the good, but we wouldn't be willing to just contribute on our own. 
Now, how could we do that with public matching? Well, it's pretty obvious. If there's 100 people, every dollar someone gives, they match it $99 to that. So that it's as if everyone was contributing. But we're not all homogeneous. So the question is, how do we do that in a world where everyone's different? Well, what you'd like to do is you want to sort of scale up the contribution by the fraction of the population that that individual represents, the fraction of the value that goes to them. So if, if the individual is one one thousandth of the total, you want to match 999. If they're one half, you want to match two for one. Turns out that's exactly what this principle does, and it's the only one that does that. And the reason is that the derivative of the square is the amount inside, and the derivative of the square root is one over the amount. And so what that does is that by doing the square and square root, you get exactly that if someone adds one more dollar, the amount that gets in is the ratio of the total amount that people are adding to the amount that that individual is adding. And so that leads to uniquely to optimal provision of public goods. Okay, so what, are, what would this rule look like in practice? Well, if everyone gives one dollar to the public good, the amount that is received grows as the square of the number of people contributing. So if 100 people contribute one real, the amount received is 10,000 reais, not 100. On the other hand, if a community splits in two and half people go one way, half people go the other way, then the amount of funding goes down by a factor of two in total, so each group gets one fourth. On the other hand, it scales linearly in the amount of money people give. Intuitively, this tends to match small contributions to popular causes much more than large contributions to, uh, to causes that are only a small number of people. Okay, so in practice, how are we providing all these matching funds? Well, right now at the moment, what's happening, and I'll talk about some of the experiments with this right now, the money is being given by philanthropists or by governments to do the matching. But you might say, in the long term, how can we make this a sustainable way to organize a society? And I think uh, the right answer is something that all of us have some intuitive familiarity with. So any of you know that an area with very nice schools will have high land values, right? Because people want to send their children to the schools. And in fact, um, there's a general result that under certain conditions, um, the value of the land will fully reflect the value of the school. That is, the land value will rise by precisely the amount of value that the school adds to the area. So any school that is worth building, you can fund if the school building authority controls the value of the land. Now, that's only true under some relatively narrow circumstances. So for example, if people who really love living in Rio also really love the school, then the value of the land won't rise fully by that amount because the value of the land is determined by the people who are just thinking about moving to or just thinking about moving away from Rio, whereas the value of the school might be greatest to the people who are definitely going to stay here. But there's a more general result that's called the Henry George theorem, which is based on the notion that we can divide economic activities into two categories, decreasing returns activities and increasing returns activities. So decreasing returns activities are ones like a piece of land where they have very little cost when you put the first person on, but as more and more people get on, it becomes more and more costly. The other category is increasing returns activities where it's cheaper to provide for many people than for just one. That's like the internet. Now as we talked about, increasing returns activities require these subsidies in order to work. Whereas decreasing returns activities, they'll make profits because they can charge that marginal price, but they only pay the average price. And what the Henry George theorem says is that all the value that gets created by increasing returns activities that need, requires subsidies ends up getting taken as a profit by some decreasing returns activity. 
This is actually related to an idea in computer science called a directed acyclic graph. So in computer science, there's this idea that if you have different nodes and some of them create value and then they go somewhere, that eventually some other node is going to end up absorbing that value. And that the amount leaving the nodes that create the value has to eventually be absorbed in the ones absorbing the value. And the goal of economic policy, I think, at a fundamental level, is to take the value out of those decreasing returns activities and recycle it back to the increasing returns activities. By doing that, you're sort of removing the friction from the system and you're creating this self-reinforcing positive cycle that's called development. One way to think about this is it's a little bit like a superconductor. So a superconductor is like an electrical circuit where you remove all the friction so the electricity just keeps flowing around. And as it does, it creates a magnetic field and then things can levitate. And this is what we have to do to the economy uh, it, by, by using the Henry George theorem. Okay, now you might ask yourself, wait, but, I, but you talked about taxing, taking value out. Doesn't taxes slow down the economy? Doesn't it reduce the, doesn't it create frictions? And it turns out that actually there's a way to tax the value from decreasing returns activities that actually increases the process, that actually make, reduces the friction. And this was an insight uh, that originally came from this guy, Arnold Harberger. So Arnold Harberger is famous or infamous depending on what side of the political spectrum you come from, depending on what you thought about the coup celebrations, I guess, the other day, um, in Chile, because he created the pro program of the Chicago Boys going down to advise governments in Chile. But it turns out that it was originally not to advise the dictatorship. It was originally to advise the Christian Democratic government in the early 1960s because his wife, like my wife who first brought me to Brazil, uh, was Chilean. And um, he had an ingenious idea for that government of how to fix their tax system. Um, and I'm going to read to you uh, what he said. Actually, this was originally in Spanish because it was a proposal to the government there. So he says, if you have to make a base for taxes, adopt criteria that determine the true economic value. The solution the economist offers is simple and direct. Allow the owner to declare the value himself, make the values public, and oblige the owner to sell his property to any person willing to pay the declared value. The system is simple and creates incentives even beyond those existing in the market for assets to be employed in their most productive economic use. This idea has been rediscovered many times since uh, uh, Harberger first proposed it. It was actually proposed by Marie Salé, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in the late 70s. And it was rediscovered uh, by myself and this graduate student from Har uh, Stanford a few years ago who's going to teach at the University of Chicago, Anthony Zay. So to illustrate uh, why this idea, in addition to raising a huge amount of revenue, um, would and, and extracting the value from these decreasing returns activities would actually accelerate economic development. So to see this, um, consider the radio spectrum. So right now, this is an artistic depiction of the radio spectrum. You see it's broken up into all these tiny little components. And if you're Verizon or Google or Claro or I don't know what, what the carriers are, Telefonica here, um, it's divided up into all these tiny little parts. Uh, and you'd have to negotiate with all these people to get control and to build a new service. But under this policy, uh, everyone would have to assign a price to the parts they own. So imagine the Q91.5 has this pink bit here, and it assigns a value of $20 million to that. Now, it could change that at any time to $30 million. Um, however, it would have to pay a price on the a tax based on the average price over those months. So six months at 20 million, six months at 30 million, say there was a 7% tax rate, they would have to pay a million and three quarters dollars in order to maintain control of that asset. But from the perspective of Verizon, the great benefit here is that there's a price on each little bit of spectrum. So they can come in and say, oh, what if I want to buy this bit? Here's the price. What if I want to buy that, that bit? 
more expensive. I'll stay away from that. So rather than them choosing something and then doing a whole complicated set of negotiations, there's a transparent set of prices that they can use to make their decisions. And then once they've done it, they can repackage the amount as a billion dollars for this, by the way, on which they'll pay $70 million every year to the public. And then they can take this part that they don't need, put it back on the market at $5 million. And what this does is not only does it make the market more fluid and dynamic and allow new uh, opportunities to entrepreneurs and investors, not only does it raise a huge amount of revenue by socializing most ownership of wealth and eliminating the domination of private wealth, but it also has a very important philosophical property, which is that old organizations, these organizations I'm talking about that will, could replace corporations and nation states, will gradually decay because they'll have to pay taxes and they'll have to put a price on the things. And unless the public is continually reinvesting in them by their matching funds, they'll die off and they'll be bought out by other things. It's like a more dynamic and flexible way to constantly have elections for everything. Okay, so then the question is, how do we govern these organizations? How do they make decisions? Well, you can use one of these ideas very related to quadratic finance for that as well, called quadratic voting. This is a system where rather than having one person, one vote, and the majority dominates the minority, every citizen receives a fund of votes. And they can use these votes on the issues that are most important to them. But it becomes increasingly expensive the more votes you put on something. The first vote, one. The second vote, two, the third vote, three. So you are going to buy votes up to the point where it's just worth it to get the next vote. So if you care three times as much, you'll get three times as many votes as someone else because you'll be willing to buy that third vote. And this means that rather than the minor majority winning, every everything is in proportion to how important it is to everyone. And we actually have a voting system that can represent the overall interests of a society rather than just the domination of a majority. And that in turn allows us to move beyond this notion that voting and collectives are just this arbitrary thing. Instead, we can truly have the notion of out of many, one, or something that represents the interests of the groups that are the individuals that are part of it. But in fact, we don't only need to think of it going in that direction. We don't need to take the individual as the basis and the group as what emerges from it. In fact, if you think about individuals, if you think about what we do in economics, we explain people's preferences as a function of all of their demographics or other data we have about them. But all of those are, of course, groups, communities that they're part of. They're their educational community. They're their family community. They're their age occupation, their sexual community, etc. And so in fact, we can think of the individual and her preferences as being the aggregation or the intersection of the community she's a part of. So we don't have to take the individual or the community as primitive. We can take both as part of this relationship with each other so that we move beyond this idea of an isolated individual or a homogeneous collective towards a notion that I think is much more appealing that was um, in which all of us, rather than having income, where it's I buy this private good or you get that private good, instead we're all part of communities. And those communities supply goods to us, things that we need. And we use our voice to choose which communities we participate in and we add to and that then are able to supply us with the things we need. And in fact, this is a large part of the way that, for example, the Scandinavian welfare state works. Most goods are supplied somehow socially, but very little is done directly by the national government. So much is done by a whole range of different community organizations that people are part of and that they grant their democratic participation to. 
That idea was named by Danielle Allen, who is a philosopher at Harvard and a colleague of mine, polypolitanism. The notion that instead of corporations or nation states, what we have instead is a wide range of different communities, each of which we're a citizen of. And that it is that diverse set of communities we participate in that gives us our democratic identity. And I think that that vision helps move us beyond the ridiculous set of binaries that have defined the politics of the 20th, 20th century. And once you list off these binaries, it's obvious why you'd have the conflict of capitalism versus communism and why both have an element of truth and yet are completely inconsistent and we can't possibly be, both be right. There must be an alternative to these absurd binaries. So think about it. In politics, we say equal voice, equal vote. Everyone has one vote on everything. Absolutely. In economics, oh, well, of course there's going to be income inequality. In politics, everyone's supposed to be a homogeneous member of the nation state. In economics, everyone's a unique sunflower. Do whatever you want. Individual freedom. In politics, collectivism. In economics, individualism. In politics, no, we're not supposed to think about our individual interests. We're supposed to think about what is in the good of the nation and reason about that. In economics, oh, everyone has their own preferences. Do whatever you want. You know, individual choice, consumerism. In politics, the state. In economics, oh, there's just a bunch of entrepreneurial firms. One rises, the other falls. Yes, one's been around for 70 years and controls all this stuff, but that's just a coincidence, you know. Um, in politics, you should be able to move freely within a country, but no, you can't cross the border. In economics, open borders. Everyone should be able to move across the borders. You come onto my, per, 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 my private property, I'll shoot you. Um, in politics, we have the problems of public choice. In economics, we have the problems of private monopoly. In politics, we have the collective property. In economics, we have private property. In politics, you're just supposed to have voice, but be loyal to your country. In economics, you're supposed to just suck up whatever horrible monopolized product or go choose something else, exit. And I think these are obviously ridiculous extremes. None of them make sense. And in fact, the whole fight between left and right makes no sense because both of these things can't possibly, it just, there's no way. There's elements of truth in both of them and they're both ridiculous. So instead, I think what we need is political economy. We need diverse but ultimately equal voice where we each choose to use our voice in different areas. We need to think of individuals as the intersections of communities and communities as the intersections of individuals. We need to have a duality where we realize that individualism and collectivism at their extremes are both equally absurd and equally and, and, and absurd in the same way, but they destroy the richness of structure that makes society worth living in. It's the range of different individuals that make communities rich. And it's the range of communities that make individual life rich. The range of individuals makes the division of labor possible. The range of communities is what makes the individuals not all the same, what makes them actually unique. We need division of labor through the choice of what communities you participate in. We need emergent, flexible public goods. We can't have open borders or closed borders. What we need is clubs with some right of exclusion, but which pay taxes to the rest of the world for the exclusion that they have. We need optimal provision of public goods, not either public choice or private monopoly. Rather than private or public property, we need overlapping partial common ownership of, in many communities. And rather than either voice or exit, we need what most of us do in our social lives anyway, which is a gradual process of shifting commitments 
between different types of organizations. And in the process, we both move the resources across the organizations and we say our dissatisfaction or our happiness with them. Okay. So in the matrix, the point of getting outside of the matrix was not to just leave the world. It was to gain superpowers when you come back to the matrix, right? So I want to talk a little bit about those superpowers now um, and what we can do in the world using this. And for that, I want to talk about the framework of Eric Olin Wright, who is a great sort of um, sociologist at uh, Wisconsin. And he talked about how to be an anti-capitalist today. But you could put how to be an anti-statist today as well, because I'm equally anti-statist and anti-capitalist. Um, and he said, what we shouldn't do is on the small scale try to neutralize the harm of capitalism by escaping into a little community having nothing to do with the rest of the world. Nor should we try to overthrow capitalism today because we don't know what to replace it with. Instead, we should work <coughs> to restrain the worst excesses of capitalism in the nation state by playing off existing institutions against each other. And at the same time, we should build the seeds of experiments that can grow and beat capitalism and the nation state at their own game. And that's what we're doing. It started with a book, and you'll maybe get a chance to look at the book or buy the book afterwards if you want, and I'm happy to sign them. But um, I got a reaction to the book I couldn't have imagined. Intellectually, these have been the most productive period of my life. Anyone who's read the book will know only about 30% of what I talked about was in the book. Uh, my ideas have been evolving so much through the conversations that I've been having with people, through the 120 talks that I've given all over the world. Um, but also, incredible engagement from the press. So the book was named as one of the 50 most influential, uh, we were one of the 50 most influential people of 2018 according to Bloomberg Businessweek. I was one of the 25 people defining the next 25 years of technology according to Wired. And it was one of the Economist books of the year. But even more, people actually doing things. So there's about 100 startups that have been founded based on the ideas in the book. So much so that this blockchain publication made this cartoon character out of me, uh, which is sort of like a fighter, like street fighter or something like that, that you can buy on the Ethereum blockchain. And he has a brains of nine, charisma of seven, but fighting ability of one because his weapon is a pencil. Um, and we've been working with governments all over the world. So, uh, and across the political spectrum, with the Conservative Party in Britain, and with the socialist bloc in the European Parliament. Here we are in the chambers of the European Parliament with one of their deputies founding a data labor union together. Um, and uh, this all became really a social movement, a social movement called Radical Exchange, far beyond anything I could have imagined. Um, Groups just popped up all around the world, in London, in Singapore, in, in Latin America. We now have 120 radical exchange groups around the world uh, after just four months from the first one being founded. We had a global conference in Detroit with 500 people. And this is actually my wife uh, giving a talk to them about how private property has impeded development in Latin America, contrary to a lot of the uh, uh, common views. Governor Gavin Newsom in California is pushing through the legislature a bill based on some of the ideas in the book. Um, Margaret de Vestire, the commissioner for competition in the European Union, adopted some of our antitrust ideas uh, in January. There were, um, there's a new version of the game of Monopoly that people have been playing based on some of the ideas in the book. And in fact, that sort of artistic engagement is incredibly crucial to the movement. Uh, um, it was mentioned earlier that I uh, am no longer the chair of the movement, of the foundation, and the reason is that uh, I turned it over to the control of an artist because art and communicating and imagining this world are so important to uh, the success of all of this. But then there are 
startup. So this is an example of a startup that's now put $75,000 worth of matching funds into this quadratic finance system to fund open source software development. There have been academic papers written about all sorts of elements of this. There's program evaluations going on all over the world of the experiments that are going on around these things. Um, so this has all become this huge force in just less than a year. The first talk I gave about this was about a year ago. And I hope many of you will be inspired to get engaged in this age when not only do we have all these divisions within our societies, not only, uh, you know, is there this huge inequality growing in wealthy countries and stagnating economies, but we have populists offering the solutions of the past. I think we need to be able to embrace technology, openness, diversity, and markets as solutions to the most fundamental uh, problems we're facing in our society. And I hope many of you will be part of uh, making that change with me. Thank you.